facts. We have Dr. Maria Mohammed, who is the Director, Chief Executive, National Veterinary Research Institute from. She graduated with a DVM degree from Ahmadou Bello University, Zaria, a, master, a master's degree from the University of London, and a PhD in poultry medicine from the University of Maiduguri. She has a postgraduate diploma in agricultural education from the um, Wolverhampton Polytechnic UK. She's also a fellow of the College of Veterinary Surgeons, Nigeria. Wow, ma'am, this is, this is a beautiful CV. And then we also have with us, Dr. Clement Maseko, who is the Assistant Director Influenza and Trans um, Transboundary Animal Disease, National Veterinary Research Institute form. And his area of research interests are virology, um, virology and infectious diseases at human animal interface, um, zoonoses, animal reservoir and disease ecology, pandemic preparedness and response, preventive medicine, including vaccination and immunology. So where our, we, we, you know, we all know um, why we're here today. We have our topic, avian influenza outbreak. So we're going to be discussing the disease itself the data, the diagnosis, and the deterrent measure. And then we'll have Dr. Mari um, Dauda, who I introduced at the beginning to have um, to present a case, a real life case, which he handled um, here in Nigeria in JUS. Um, so thank you so much for joining. I can see we have about 79 people. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for making out time. Um, we hope each and every one of us will be able to take one or two things from this session. Um, yes, please. Okay, and um, so we'll just go to the next item of the agenda, which is a brief about Farmalat by Dr. Kayo De Femi, who is the founder of Farmalat and my boss. Welcome on board, sir. <laughs> All right, good morning, uh, uh, good afternoon, rather. And uh, a great job you're doing, Dr. Tumse. I want to thank every one of us, uh, especially the senior colleagues I see uh, in the chat bot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ghani. Thank you, Professor Fashina. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tunji and uh, Professor Oladele. I see every one of us, and I want to thank uh, everyone uh, for supporting this great movement. Well, a brief about Farmalat uh, and what we do and why we are here. Right? Uh, if, if... Dr. Tumsi, are you? Can you all hear me? Yes, please go on. All right, so uh, I, I, think, uh, I think the animal health system in Africa is vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to quite a lot of things, uh, disease outbreaks, uh, uh, low productivity of our stocks. And then of course we see this uh, constant gap uh, between uh, the best practice that needs to happen on the field uh, compared with what we're taught in school. So what we are doing with this tele-education series is to see how we can bridge the knowledge gap and attempt to solve some of this vulnerability we see in the animal health uh, uh, system with the ultimate hope uh, that one day or sooner, sooner than we expect, the animal health sector in Nigeria and in Africa will be strengthened through our various contributions. So, on behalf of the Farmer team, I want to welcome every one of us. And I know it's going to be a really wonderful learning experience for every one of us. Thank you. And then do have a wonderful time uh, learning. Dr. Tumsia, over to you. We're going to share the materials. Yeah, if, um, the PDF version of all the presentation um, done today. So don't worry. We're going to share through the emails you all registered. For the session with person who will take uh, on the next uh, uh, it's uh, MDoc, who is one of our partners. MDoc, please can you quickly just take off the stage? Sure. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session today. My name is Adora Odukwe. I am a senior project manager with MDoc. Um, MDoc is a digital health company that optimizes the end-to-end -end self care support that um, we provide. Um, to people with regular and chronic and chronic health needs. 
We are happy to be here today. We are happy to partner with Farm Alert with um, Making More Health to launch this very first echo session. It's been an interesting journey. And so it's very, um, it's very wonderful to see this come to life. Um, what we'll just say, sit back, relax. Please feel free to send in your questions. There's a lot of knowledge packed in this one. So please feel free to send in your questions, send in your comments. We're happy to take them. And um, we would like you to please put on your camera so that we feel like we're all in the same room. It will be great for the interaction. Thanks, everyone. Uh, back to you, Dr. Tumsia. All right, so I, 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 uh, before Dr. Tumsiat uh, comes uh, up, uh, so we have one uh, of the people who have actively supported Farmalat, uh, that's in the person of Nasser, uh, Kat, uh, Nasser Kataramu uh, from Making More Health. Do you mind saying a few two minutes words, uh, a goodwill message before we move into the uh, class didactic presentation for today? Nasser. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Femi. Uh, my name is Nasir Katuramu. I work with uh, Ashoka Innovators for the Public. I'm also a project manager for the Making More Health Accelerator Program um, that supports ventures in animal health, both human and, and animal, um, both human health and animal health um, across Africa. And uh, it's an accelerator program that identifies the most promising projects across the continent and we support them financially and provide them technical support to help them scale and grow their work. And we are very, very proud to be associated with both uh, FarmAlert and MDOC, uh, both of which are companies that have been a part of our accelerator program. And indeed, uh, this uh, development um, is a byproduct of, um, uh, of the work that we've been doing together as part of that accelerator. So I couldn't be prouder and I congratulate both uh, Femi and his team um, at Farmalat, and uh, also congratulate very much Adora and the entire team at MDOC. Uh, they have both worked very hard together to get to this point, and they have made this uh, session possible. I welcome you all to what is the very first echo session that is focused on animal health. So this is a huge milestone uh, for all the organizations that are involved, and, uh, and, and we're hoping to see more as we move ahead. I think that Farmalat has positioned itself as a pioneer in a, in a way uh, in really uh, taking education uh, of vet officers across Africa to the next level through this platform. So congratulations and I wish you all a fantastic session. Thank you. Um, okay, um, Nasser Kataramo, thank you so much. That was um, Nasser Kataramo from Making More Health Accelerator Program. Thank you for joining us. As he said, so Farmalat is um, the first to leverage the eco model in the animal health space in the world, not just in Africa. So yes, and um, we've taken the pre-quiz. We had a good um, turnout. We had about 68% um, response from um, the participants. So we'll just go straight to the didactic presentation by the hub expert, Dr. Clement Meseko. He'll be talking about avian influenza outbreak. Um, he'll be talking about the disease, the data, and the diagnosis. Dr. Clement Maseko, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning from different parts of the world. I'd like to stand in briefly for my chief executive, who is uh, at this moment uh, having a presentation with the National Assembly. Um, so I'll, I'll take a portion of the slides and then that will also transist into portions that have been assigned to me. Thank you. Uh, can we have the slide, please? Thank you. Um, no, I, I think we'll, we'll have the the initial slides will be the one that will be presented by the chief executive. So we'll start with that before, oh yes, this very one. Okay, so we'll move to the next slide now. So the presentation will be in this order. I, I'll give you a brief uh, history about NVRI and the regional lab for highly pathogenic avian influenza. And then I will mention how the first highly pathogenic avian influenza was introduced to Nigeria. And, uh, and we've had several waves of uh, highly pathogenic even influenza in the country. 
since almost uh, 20 years down the line. And uh, so, but we still having outbreaks, so I will give uh, a little brief on the current scenario with respect to highly pathogenic avian influenza in Nigeria, because we currently still have the disease. And then we'll talk a, a bit about the disease, and then that will also translate into a more detailed uh, discussion on the disease, the data, and uh, detailing measure. Next slide. So the National Veterinary Research Institute, as you know, uh, is the national reference lab for animal diseases in the country. It was established in 1924, and uh, in another two years, it will be 100 years old. So it's been a long journey along the line. And uh, if there are diseases that have made very critical impact on the Institute and Nigeria, one of such is the highly pathogenic avian influenza. Before then, there was rinderpest, and uh, rinderpest was actually the reason why the institute was established in 1924. And uh, so beyond that, there had been a lot of uh, diseases that the institute has been able to manage. And then one very important one, and that is still current to us now, is the highly pathogenic avian influenza. And we are able to do this uh, operating in the BSA-2 and BSA-3 facilities for the disease and many other transboundary animal diseases in the country. To date, the Institute responds timely to all animal health emergencies, including highly pathogenic avian influenza. Next slide. And the highly pathogenic avian influenza was introduced because it was a disease that was not known to the country until 2006. And uh, since then, we have been involved in the diagnosis, surveillance, and control. As I mentioned earlier, NVRI served as the national reference lab for highly pathogenic NVRI influenza and fulfills the establishment mandate. Uh, I, at this point, I would like to say that uh, when it comes to disease uh, control and all aspects of uh, animal health and veterinary operations in Nigeria, we have the chief veterinary officer that is doing sign in the Ministry of Agri that is the ultimate authority. So the data that we will be presenting here is subject to their evaluation. And I must also concede that uh, they, are the, uh, they are the one that have the last say when it comes to highly pathogenic avian influenza. However, NGRI serves the purpose, particularly with respect to uh, diagnostic uh, confirmation of all animal diseases in the country, and where it comes to uh, fulfilling also the mandate of uh, the veterinary department. So some of the data that will be presented here uh, may still be subject to approvals uh, of the chief CVON. And uh, however, NBRI is recognized and designated as the FPO West and Central Africa Regional Laboratory for Highly Pathogenic Avian Influenza. And we've been doing this since uh, 2006 when the disease was first introduced. And NBRI is also recognized as an OIE FPO, OFLU, Global Expertise on Animal Influenza. So the Institute is consulted in many respects when it comes to diseases, many diseases, but also specifically for highly pathogenic avian influenza. Next slide. So I mentioned that it's uh, been several waves of highly pathogenic avian influenza. And then one important takeaway message is to also let you know that the disease was introduced. So if it was introduced, when was it first introduced? I said 2006. And then after 2006, what has happened? We've had periods where there had been no reported cases, and we had periods where we have been in seasons of outbreaks. So this current wave, if we count it from 2006, could be said to be the fourth wave of highly pathogenic avian influenza introduction in Nigeria. And this fourth wave started in January 2021. of agree. So the data that you see uh, are not sacrosanct, but at least it gives us a guide of uh, the burden of highly pathogenic avian influenza. So, so far from January 2021 to 
date in March, March 2022, we've recorded confirmed cases of about 414. And uh, this had been broken down into different subtypes. So it means that uh, it is not only one subtype of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza that is currently circulating in Nigeria. We've confirmed H5N1 in about 387 cases. We've seen H5N8 in 18 cases. And there are some that uh, has not been completely resolved. So guided, we just call it H5NS. So it's to con turn out to be H5N1 or turn out to be H5N8. And in some cases, depending on some of the research that we're, going, we, we're running now, it could even be another subtype, or it could even be a, 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 a reassortment of H5N1 or H5N8. Data on this will be made available as soon as we are more certain. And uh, by the number of uh, flock that has been uh, estimated to have been affected, uh, 2.3 million beds, you know? That means if you have a farm that uh, has been affected and um, maybe your flock size is uh, 20,000 beds, and then another farm has 100,000 beds, by the time we estimate the populations that were affected among the 414 cases, the estimated affected flock is 2.3. And uh, so when farmers report uh, cases or when there's a suspicion of cases, the population that is said to have uh, died within those times have been estimated to be about uh, half a million. But if a diagnosis is established, the control measure so far that we uh, operate in Nigeria is depopulation and decontamination. So it means that if you have a case in a farm of about 10,000 beds, and it's been confirmed by the laboratory to be highly pathogenic avian influenza. The recommendation we, is to have the beds depopulated and uh, the premises decontaminated. And this is done in order to stop the infection at that farm so that the infection doesn't move to another farm. So this is what this table has been able to show. Next slide. The cases, like I said, have been seen in about 28 states. So, uh, but at different levels of uh, 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 in, in a level of involvement, the infections are, are more in some states than some other states. So, based on the data that we've accumulated uh, over the last one year, we can see that some states are more affected than others. So, the states that are listed here that has the highest number of cases are Kano, 81, Lagos, 80, uh, Plateau, 70, and then Delta, 26, Dutch, 22, Gombe, 19, Liva, 14, Kaduna, 10, and many other states. All the other 20, uh, 28 states are also affected at various levels. What you will now uh, observe really is that there's these three states that are prominently affected, Kano, Lagos, and Plateau. And this seems to have been the scenario since 2006. This state had actually always been the state that are most severely affected by H5N1. And the interesting thing about uh, some of these states really is, apart from Lagos, is that uh, more than one subtype is circulating. So we've detected H5N1 and H5N8 in Kano, likewise in Plateau. And then if you recall in, in past years, you know, there had even been a pattern of circulations of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, which seems to be connecting Kano, Lagos, and Plateau, maybe even more of Kano and Lagos. So when there are cases of highly pathogenic even influenza in Kano, in a little while, you will find that the bears also uh, maybe move to Lagos and then Lagos is infected. But what we have seen really is that Kano, Lagos, and Plateau seems to be like a hotspot of highly pathogenic avian influenza. Some other states like, uh, like Kabauchi and Gombe are also kind of uh, very closely associated with some of the scenarios that we see in, in Kano and Lagos. Now you also notice that H5N1, H5N8 is also circulating in Bauchi and Gombe. Kaduna was the very first state where the initial case in 2006 was uh, identified. So uh, collectively, we seem to have zones in the country. What this table will show us is that we have, seem to have zones in the country that are peculiarly uh, affected more than some other cases. So that's uh, other, other states. And, and this also is a good data because uh, it will help particularly in planning for deterrence and mitigation to know where attentions could be focused. And if attentions are focused in the high body state, 
there's a possibility of being able to contain this pathogen within those area, create like a control zone so that other states will now not be affected. And also, so far we've seen that we have some hotspot states in Nigeria and that will also help us in planning our control measures. Next slide. At the moment, Nigeria is still experiencing active outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza, like other countries in West Africa, Ghana, Cameroon, Senegal. Even globally, we still have several cases of highly pathogenic avian influenza in Europe and America. In Europe and America, there seems to be an initial high involvement of white, white, white bears. So when eventually the white bears uh, kind of uh, have contact with domestic poultry, that is when the virus is introduced. And so at the moment now, there are several cases of outbreaks of highly pathogenic influenza all over the world. Um, America is also experiencing uh, its own outbreak. Uh, but however, Nigeria is peculiar because if you look at the cases that are recorded in Africa, uh, uh, most of them are usually reported from Nigeria. In the next slide, we are going to see that of the cases that have been reported so far in this current week, 72.9% of all of them are from Nigeria. So you can imagine that Nigeria seems to carry a high burden of the highly pathogenic event influenza in Africa. And it's also kind of uh, means that uh, sometimes when we have been able to recall up to 414 outbreaks, so it means that globally, we are also carrying a, a large chunk of the burden of outbreak of avian influenza in the world. The country is then apparently a hotspot of highly pathogenic avian influenza with great loss to, to the light of industry. Because when we say there are cases, I mean, these cases translate into a lot of morbidity and mortality. So at the end of the day, you have a great loss to the poultry industry, and uh, in effect, it also affects the national economy. Next slide. So this, this is the map I, I showed, uh, I, I referred to in the previous slide. That's, if you see the cases in West Africa, for instance, uh, uh, West Africa, occasionally we have cases in South Africa, but West Africa seems to even be more affected at the present moment. We've seen cases in Senegal, we've seen cases as far as uh, uh, Cam or Cameroon, we've seen cases in uh, Ghana, in Burkina Faso, Mali. But most of these cases, if you put all of them together, of all these cases that you've seen in this map, 70%, over 70% are reported in Nigeria. So Nigeria is a hotspot of highly pathogenic avian influenza. So it also means that uh, regional governments, uh, international government, if we will be able to control highly pathogenic avian influenza even across the world, special attention must be paid to Nigeria. Next slide. So how was this disease introduced into the country since 2006? Like we said, the first case was in 2006, reported in a popular farm then that was called Sambawa Farm, Kaduna State. Initial speculation that time uh, kind of try to identify two major routes of introduction of highly pathogenic avian influenza into Nigeria. One was that uh, probably trade in poultry and pro poultry products, maybe from other West African countries or even across the border in China, may have been responsible because they are about that time the higher burden was in China. So we were wondering, probably there was a trade between Nigeria and, and, and China, maybe some person smuggled some poultry products that introduced the virus, or that migratory wild bears may be responsible. But data over time has shown that migratory wild bears are most likely the source of introduction of highly pathogenic avian influenza into Nigeria. By migratory wild bears, I mean, I, I mean to say that there are birds that are wild, and these birds are migratory at the same time. So it means that there are birds that move across borders. There are some birds that move from China to Europe, from Europe to Africa, and they could even move to America. This map shows the intercontinental migration of wild birds and try to depict the flyways. The lines that you are seeing crisscrossing the countries are called flyways, and there are many flyways all over the world. The ones that cross countries in Africa, particularly Nigeria, are the Asian East African flyway, the Atlantic America flyway, the Black Sea Mediterranean flyway. If you see some red dots on those maps that you see, on the map that you see, these are where the flyways transect. So it means one or two flyways meet. 
The implication of that is that birds that follow one flyway and uh, other group of birds that follow another flyway, they have the chance of meeting where those white dots are. And if they meet in those places, it means that if it is not all the time that the white birds are carriers of avian influenza, but for adventure, there are white birds in a particular flyway that meet with other white birds in another flyway that have avian influenza, there will be a transmission. So the transmission could even start within the migratory white bird. And these migratory white birds also have resting points across the world. And Nigeria is one of such resting points. We have a wide wetland uh, ecological environment that is suitable for the resting and even for the feeding or wintering. Sometimes we call it wintering of these white birds. Wintering in the sense that there are times when the winter becomes too harsh, maybe in uh, Europe or uh, the, the further north in the pole. And then the bears try to move from the harsh winter and they come to warmer zones. And, and, and these warmer zones are down towards the uh, equatorial zone. And Nigeria happens to be one of such places. So they come over and they actually land in Nigeria. And why they land in Nigeria, resting, hibernating, and maybe even breeding, after that season is over, they return back to where they are coming from. So by why they are in Nigeria, for instance, and they, for adventure, have highly pathogenic avian influenza, they may have contact with our own uh, white birds, that's resident white birds. Our resident white birds, including waterfowls, will also have contact with domestic poultry in the villages. The contact with the domestic poultry in the villages are such that such birds, when they are infected, particularly waterfowl, they may not even show signs that they have highly pathogenic avian influenza. And during market days, some of these birds are gathered and taken to live bird market. So in the course of that, they will now also have contact with poultry or some other birds in the live bird market where farmers also visit. So the live bird market in Nigeria seems to be like a melting pot where there will be these interchanges. So that is how avian influenza is most likely introduced into Nigeria. And this has happened several times. And to also confirm to you that we have these white birds in Nigeria, they, some of them have actually been caught physically. This picture that you're seeing in the screen is an, it's a migratory osprey. It was caught by farmers in Kebbi State and on, on its leg are rings. There's a ring that shows where the bird is coming from. And this is more than one of such birds that have been caught in Nigeria, which confirms to us that migratory white birds visit Nigeria. And some of the migratory wild bear samples has been taken from them and they have turned out to be avian influenza, some even highly pathogenic avian influenza. So this seems to be a more plausible uh, way that highly pathogenic avian influenza is introduced into the country. Not, knowledge is power. By the time we know this, this also will help us in guiding on how those can be prevented. Some of the deterrent measures that we'll be discussing. Next slide. So highly pathogenic avian influenza has been known since 1878. So I mean, the disease is, uh, it's just that science is catching up with the disease. So the disease has always been around because in that year, there were cases of uh, high mortality in poultry. And, uh, and, and, and as such, that time, nobody knew it was a virus. Nobody knew it was highly pathogenic avian influenza. It was simply described as foul play, but it is, in subsequent studies by science that eventually we knew it to be avian influenza and we even started to describe it as highly pathogenic avian influenza starting from the 1950s. However, the yeah, outbreak were not common around that time. You know, there may be sporadic cases here and there, but the more recent and sustained uh, episodic of highly pathogenic avian influenza began in 1996, then into 2004 from China. China seems to be prominent for a number of diseases. And then from China, the disease was also now reported in, in Europe. And about that time, Nigeria was actually conscious that there's a possibility that the virus may be introduced into Nigeria. That, that's one good uh, proactive measure then. Because before the virus was even introduced into Nigeria, Nigerian authorities were kind of uh, careful and uh, were already prepared that this disease that started in China and is already reported in Europe may eventually be introduced into Nigeria. And this actually happened through to prediction in 2006. Let, let, let me give you a brief uh, description. Uh, Doc, Doc before, you, before you go ahead, uh, and thank you for the very detailed uh, lectures. 
just that we have like five minutes to get this done so that we can get into the interaction. So we appreciate if you uh, kindly hurry up with the presentation. Thank you. Doctor. Thank you. So again, influenza is an auto virus and there are several genera, including A, B, C, D. The influenza A, influenza highly pathogenic influenza we're talking about now belongs to the general flu A. So it means there are other avian influenzas that may also have the potential of being introduced into Nigeria. The influenza A, where we have the avian influenza, appears in two forms. So apart from the highly pathogenic avian influenza that we are discussing now, there are also low pathogenic avian influenza. I mean, as the name implies. But the risk really is that even when you have a low pathogenic avian influenza, there's a possibility of it being transformed. There can be a change from low pathogenic avian influenza to highly pathogenic avian influenza. And within the uh, influenza A, where we have the avian influenza, we have several subtypes, you know, described based on their hemagglutinin and neuraminidin. So we have 16 different subtypes based on the HA hemagglutinin, which can be combined with three, nine different neuraminidins so that by the time you have combination of 16 HA and 9 NA, over 200 possibilities of highly pathogenic avian influenza may be seen. And the highly pathogenic avian influenza present a severe onset of generalized systemic disease. I mean, that is where we call it highly pathogenic avian influenza. Low pathogenic avian influenza may be a respiratory disease or a uh, enteric disease. But when it comes to highly pathogenic avian influenza, all organs, all tissues can be affected. And lesions are noticed in all these tissues, resulting in systemic failure and pathologic outcome. When a farmer notices highly pathogenic avian influenza, sometimes it is that he wakes up in the morning and finds that all the birds in his farm are dead. Next slide. All right, so we will transition into the next slide. Uh, so I think we are right on time now. Now we are continuing this discussion on highly pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, so the previous slide uh, was supposed to have been taken by the director chief executive of uh, NBRI. Next slide, please. Uh, so in this next presentation, we'll talk more about the diagnosis, the virological data, economic data, detailed measures, and I'll give you a summary of animal influenza in Nigeria, and then we'll conclude before the discussion. Next slide. So if we are to diagnose highly pathogenic avian influenza, now that we have seen that there has been an, uh, uh, an introduction into a farm, and the farmer woke up suddenly and discovered that uh, 90 to 100% of all the bears in his farm have died. I mean, the things he, he, he will be alarmed, but one thing is to seek for information. So one of the first information is to find out what is responsible for the mortality and the, mo the morbidity and the high mortality that has been noted. So the diagnosis will involve uh, having to know the history. Of course, some of those history will now be that he woke up suddenly and saw that the bears were dead. And the clinician will probably ask him, um, where, where, how old are the bears? Where was the source of the bed? Uh, did you bring a new bed to your farm? And then the clinician will also look at the presentation, high mortality. And then he may take some of these beds for necropsy. And then he will now try to identify some pathological lesion. But all these will not be sufficient to make a diagnosis of highly pathogenic avian influenza because there are many other diseases that appear in the form of highly pathogenic avian influenza. In fact, sometimes you may not be able to differentiate between highly pathogenic avian influenza and very virulent Newcastle disease. So to be able to confirm this, sample has to be taken to the laboratory for confirmation. And in 2006, this was actually the pattern that were followed. So when the virus was uh, first reported in Nigeria, some of these outlines of diagnostic procedures were where we started with. So initial times we were able to do isolation of the causative organism, the causative, causative pathogen in chicken embryonated egg. So that's time we will inoculate the samples from the uh, cases that were submitted into chicken embryonated egg. The virus will grow in the egg. And then we we'll now harvest the virus that has been grown in the egg and we'll be able to identify the anti antigen, you know, using a reference antigen that is complementary by AGID. And then we we'll do serology, magnetination, inhibition tests. All these we were able to make diagnosis of highly pathogenic avian influenza. And we were using this effectively all through in 2006, up to when uh, we were able to introduce conventional PCR 
And conventional PCR is faster because with isolation, you probably may need to wait for uh, between uh, one day to three to five days for the virus to grow in embryonated egg. But with PCR, it's involved uh, making an extraction of the, the, the nucleic acid of the causative pathogen from the sample that was submitted to, to the laboratory. So this will now be amplified. And then it will, there will now be a process of electrophoresis and you'll be able to now make some determinations of the bands, determinations of, uh, uh, I mean, based on specific primers that were used. And then you'll have a reference control. By the time all that is put together, within 24 to 48 hours, we are able to make a diagnosis of highly pathogenic even in pleasure. And we started using conventional PCR in 2007, 2008. But PCR has also advanced to a type that is called real time, sometimes called quantitative PCR. This we also adopted from 2006. And what, what this means is that sometimes after the extraction of uh, the nucleic acid from the sample that is submitted to the laboratory, this is a closed system of amplification and a real time detection using some, some dyes you know, that can now reflect on the computer screen. And then we'll make a faster diagnosis of highly pathogenic avian influenza, even by just, just within a within few, few hours. So some diagnoses are established within 24 hours or less than uh, uh, 24 hours. This now increases the turnaround time. Because one of the things that is important is if there's an outbreak in a farm and we're able to make a diagnosis as quickly as possible, the information is communicated back to the field officers who can then start to depopulate and decontaminate because the objective would be to make sure that the virus doesn't leave that premise to another premise, you know, reducing transmission of inter-farm transmission or interstate transmission. Interestingly, when we started making diagnosis of highly pathogenic avian influenza, it was only one subtype that was, was a, a, a concern in Nigeria then, H5N1. And then we have several clays within the H5N1. But as time goes on, we started having multiples of subtypes circulating in Nigeria, as we have earlier discussed in the previous slide. Whereas we now have H5N1, H5N8. So it may not be enough to be able to establish a diagnosis just by running a real-time PCR to now establish that we have H avian influenza. Even when we can say we have avian influenza, sometimes it will be necessary for us to know which subtype. So, Another advanced form of diagnosis is the use of multiplex qPCR, where we can, in the same run, be able to determine if we have H5N1. So, because the primary. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Maseko. We have just um, five minutes to wrap up your presentation. Thank you very much, okay. sir. Okay, I'll do it. So, after a diagnosis has been made, sometimes it's also important for us to know the molecular characterization of this particular virus. So we are trying to build capacity in NVRI, but for now we are also eventually uh, having to send some of those samples to OIE FU reference laboratories that are able to do molecular sequencing. Next slide. So this, these pictures you see now are some of the clinical presentations of a highly pathogenic avian influenza. Apart from the sudden then that you see, sometimes you find respiratory, circulatory, nervous systems involvement. And the pathological lesions will include hemorrhages, swollen head, bluish comb. And all this impact on morbidity and mortality. And because it also affects the reproductive system. So if you have a layer farm, there will be sharp drops in egg production, or there could even be cessation of egg production. Important point to take away is that highly pathogenic avian influenza is a destructive disease. Next slide. And this data shows that since from 2006 to 2008, we had an introduction of H5N1, clay 22 and clay 2213. So several clays within H5N1 were introduced. And then we didn't have an outbreak. It was successfully contained. And then in 2015 to 2018, we now have an introduction of a different virus that circulated in 2006 to 2008. That one was clay 23216. We are able to do know that also because of the molecular sequencing I tried to explain earlier. So that shows that even the introduction that was we had in 2006 or 2008 was actually eliminated because today we've not had any introduction of that clay back in Nigeria. But now in 2021 and 2022, we have another introduction 
of H5N1, and it is of a different clade. So what you will notice now is that we'll be having recurring episode of highly pathogenic avian influenza, but it has always been a different clade. So it means that Nigeria is actually free of avian influenza until there's an introduction from overseas. And then the maps you see now shows how widespread avian influenza is in Nigeria. Next slide. But when we talk about virological data, sometimes we need to also be able to appreciate this highly pathogenic avian influenza based on the economic data. In 2006 to 2008, we have over 300 outbreaks and over 1.2 million bears were called in the outbreak that occurred. And infection, now trying to really kind of put into context the economic impact. A study that was done by Fasina et al, my colleague who is also on this call, estimated that if an infection can affect 10% of commercial bear population in Nigeria, it will cost about $245 million. Interestingly, the work that was done also by Quagi said up to 2.5% of Nigeria populations are, are affected. So if you take a, a juxtapose the figure, uh, the estimation and the figure, you will now appreciate that highly pathogenic given influenza each time it occurs in Nigeria or when it occurred in the previous time has cost this nation up to 61 to 175 million dollars as economic impact, which can be estimated to be 21.3 billion naira. I mean, this is not a small money. So at the end of the day, it's affecting a lot of people, their livelihood, their means of income, even their employment. And this didn't stop at that. In 2015, we had a recurrence outbreak. And as a matter of fact, the outbreak in the wave in 2015 to 2018 and 19 is estimated to have doubled what we initially experienced. So we now have greater than 600 outbreaks. And as at that time, over 2.7 million bears were caught and we were 4 million bears exposed. And there was a, a cessation, a brief cessation until 2021 and 2022. So at the moment, we are still having recurring outbreaks, and we, within which over 414 outbreaks have been recorded, and 2.8 million bears have already been destroyed. Uh, as I said earlier, these are raw data, and I saw some of this can still be corroborated with, with what the uh, Chief Veterinary Officer of Nigeria will let us know. Next slide. So what, what will be the deterrent measure? Essentially, maybe after the case presentation, we are going to be able to discuss at length on the deterrent measure. But I will quickly let you know that if we must prevent a highly pathogenic avian influenza and effectively control the disease, some of the things we need to do very seriously is bow surveillance. Uh, it can be active, it can be passive, it can be setting it. We still have time to expand on that. And Bow security, bow security is very important because it is said that prevention is better than cure. So bow security are such measures that will be taken by farmers and by states and by country at large to stop even influenza from being introduced in the first place or to stop even influenza from being taken into the farm or even when taken to a particular farm, since that we will need to do to ensure that the infection is limited to that farm and is not transmitted to another farm. And the third point is controlled vaccination. I, I mean control vaccination because uh, there are a lot of challenges in vaccination, even though some persons think vaccination is, 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 a, is a, bullet, a magic bullet. It isn't as simple as, as it sounds. So we need to also now start to open the discussion on how can we control vaccination, I, I involve ourselves into vaccine research and development, so that even if we must adopt vaccination, how best can we adopt vaccination that will be able to complement uh, biosecurity and surveillance for the control of highly pathogenic avian influenza. Next slide. One quick point I'd like to also mention is that while we're talking about highly pathogenic avian influenza, avian influenza because it affects poultry. So we've had several subtypes that has been detected in Nigeria. This include H5N1, H5N2, H5N6, H5N8, and there's even a low pathogenic avian influenza H9N2 that is also circulating in Nigeria. So Controlling avian influenza in Nigeria is more complex than we see because other animals are involved, multiple subtypes are involved. Even in swine, we've detected H5N1, we've detected H5N1. And in equine, that's horses. Recently, we've also detected H3N8. So the major concerns with all this is that if we must vaccinate, for instance, we will have to take, to take into consideration that we have multiple subtypes of this virus that is circulating in Nigeria. And then we'll be able to now decide on where vaccination can be applied in terms of zone or control vaccination and the SC strategy. And because if those are not done 
and there are more morbidity and more mortality. Eventually, the economy, even pleasure is also a diagnosis that could affect public health and could also be a source of the next pandemic because even influenza can also be a pandemic virus. We've seen that in 1918. Thank you very much. Next slide. I think that's, 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 that's the conclusion of this discussion really is that if we now need to control highly pathogenic influenza, we will bear in mind that surveillance has to be kind of uh, enhanced and our biosecurity security has to be enhanced. And then we can get involved in vaccine R&D to know how appropriately we can adopt it. NVRI has been uh, producing vaccine for the last uh, 50 or more years. So when it comes to producing uh, even influenza vaccine, it's something we can go into, but that has to be done scientifically with data and other control measures. Next slide, which is thank you. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Clement Meseko. I hope I got the name right. This has been an insightful and detailed presentation. Um, I'm sure each and every one of us will take one or two things here, right? I would say more than one or two things because I took a lot. So.